Awesome. Welcome to the CNCF End User Lounge, where we explore how technologies, cloud native technologies are adopted by end user organizations across different industries and sectors. The CNCF End User Community is formed of more than 160 vendor neutral companies that use, the open, that use open source software to deliver their product. I am Abu Bakr Siddiq Ango, a CNCF ambassador. And today with me is a team from Salt Security who will be talking with us about their journey in the cloud native ecosystem. In these live streams, we bring end user members to showcase how their organizations navigate the cloud native ecosystem to build and distribute their services and products. Join us every fourth Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. This is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that will be in violation of the code of conduct. Basically be respectful to everyone and especially fellow participants and also the presenters when sharing your opinions. If you have any questions, you can add them to the chat of this video and make sure to ask uh, any question might be related to the topic or any other thing that you want to learn from uh, the folks from uh, Salt Security. Now, before we dive into the questions, uh, Eli, Omri, and Val, could you be briefly introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eli. I'm a platform team lead in Salt Security. Here with me are Omri and Guy. I'll let them introduce themselves now. Um, Go ahead, Gal, take it. <laughs> it's going to be a short one. Hey, my name is Gal. I'm running the DevOps operations at Salt Security. Uh, and I'm Omri. I'm a platform uh, engineer um, in the platform team, Salt Security. Oh, nice. Seems we have all the people powering all the machines in the background here. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, I know Assault is all about security, so but can you share with us uh, more about your company and uh, what you do and how you do the awesome work you do? Yeah, so uh, Assault, uh, Assault's about five years old. Um, we started off um, with Kubernetes on the get-go. Um, now we have around 40 microservices today in production um, with multiple clusters. I think I'll be able to elaborate on that a little more. Um, we're very, um, like we, we use a, a lot of tools uh, and, and products from, from around the CNCF uh, landscape. Um, we love the CNCF and the community. Uh, it's been helping us a lot lately. And recently uh, in the past few years, we've dived into the whole uh, service mesh uh, journey. Uh, we've written a, we've written a uh, blog post, a great blog post that was recently published on the CNCF uh, uh, blog uh, around uh, you know our journey with uh, uh, gRPC uh, and uh, you know and, and service mesh and a little balancing around Kubernetes uh, and a lot of fun stuff like that. Uh, we'll be happy to share uh, with everyone. But yeah, it's been really great. Awesome. Okay, so can you like walk us through what your infrastructure setup is like, and uh, what are the uh, bells and whistles and the gears that run everything in the background? Uh, Guy, you want to take that? So um, we are multi-cloud. We use several cloud providers. Mostly, most of our services are in AWS. We use Kubernetes for all of our microservices. We work in a CI/CD um, deployment topology, so we use the CI/CD platform of Codefresh to deploy all of our uh, manifests. Uh, yeah, basically, it's all about Kubernetes. The entire infrastructure is deployed with Terraform, um, so we are tightly binded to Terraform Kubernetes. Oh, awesome! Yeah, that's that's interesting. But when did you start this journey? Cloud native is definitely a long journey. When did you start and why? Well, basically, from the early days in Salt Security, we've started to use Kubernetes. I mean, the simplicity, the flexibility that allows us to manage and make sure uh, our service is highly available. 
and we can maintain it and make sure to revert if needed and to guarantee our customers the best service possible. Thank you. Awesome. Ryan. Yeah. And you mentioned the other time about block with root. I went through it and uh, in it, you described how you use GRS PCX extensively. And can you shed more light about your usage of GRPC and any other tools in your arsenal that you use aside, cloud native tools that you use aside from GRPC? Uh, yeah, uh, oh, Omri, Omri handles that, uh, handles that as well. Um, maybe you can tell us more about why we chose GRPC, uh, Omri. Sure. We did that. Sure. Um, so we were using to as as familiar with all uh, with all microservice architecture than systems. Um, services need to speak to each other, right? Um, so you have many many ways to do so. And lately, we, we were using uh, direct communication between the services um, sometimes, and sometimes we were using more of a async kind of communication on top of message queues. Um, so we used Kafka. We tried uh, to evaluate a few other stuff. Uh, but in terms of, uh, of uh, synchronous communication, we were using, uh, we were using the ACA uh, framework uh, in order to speak uh, between services. Um, we had we had some issues with backwards compatibility. So um, while we were changing uh, APIs between the services, um, sometimes we had we had to cope with with uh, API changes, uh, breaking API changes, um, and then we started the process of of finding alternatives. So one of the, the first things we we knew existed and and always wanted to kind of um, evaluate was uh, was gRPC um, since gRPC is using a protobuf to serialize the messages uh, it has a very nice ecosystem of of making sure we don't introduce any kind of uh, breaking API issues uh, so this this led us to actually take this uh, this step and, and and widen our knowledge with uh, with gRPC protobuf um and then since gRPC is, is uh working on on http2 we, we've had a problem there because as as load balancing is is very um uh like familiar to kubernetes kubernetes um does it for you using the service uh, resource for example um in http2 the story is a little different the connections are sticky um and what what made us realize that if we if we will not find a solution to this uh, load balancing problem, we might have uh, some some scaling issues. Uh, and then we started researching around this one, and I think I'm going to pass it to Ellie because uh, this was a very interesting research he he's done. Yeah, the the, the journey around load balancing in, uh, in uh, Kubernetes was was actually a very interesting one. We we're looking for a way to solve that uh, load balancing problem, and um, so there are, are a couple of tools available for doing that. Uh, we can use proxies like Envoy. Um, we realized there's <clears throat> sorry there's an easy way to solve it um, with Linkerd. So, so Linkerd was one of the tools that was available for us. Uh, we tried it out. It was trivial. Uh, we ended up not only solving our load balancing uh, issue, but we also gained a lot. Um, it was very easy to maintain, but also we were able to just, you know, look at everything that is going on between the services in, in no way that was available to us before. We we're able to see all the traffic between the services. Uh, we we're able to see which excessive calls were being made from one service to another, right? So if you had one service like bombing another service with, with requests, we could see that live. Um, uh, adding on top of that is the whole uh, uh, security um, topic, which we we were just completely overlooking. And today we have we have uh, encryption uh, going between our services. So specifically MTLS, uh, our services are encrypted. Um, the communication is encrypting it end to end on uh, both sides. Also thanks to security. <clears throat> so that really changed the way that we kind of work with uh, with our services, and um, and it kind of. It integrates very well with Kubernetes, right? So if we have, uh, like Gal mentioned, we have like multi 
uh, a multi-cloud setup. Um, we have it both on AWS and on Azure. Uh, it just works, works the same on both clouds, uh, which really enables us to be very like flexible in how we, we test it, we run it. Um, and another interesting thing is that it's not only for production. So we found that it's very, it's very helpful when you're also developing. So before we reach production, we were also using Linkerd, for example, as a service mesh um, to just kind of find those problems ahead of time. But before we reach production, our developers can go on and see all the uh, anomalies and traffic that you can see between the services and then kind of mitigate them even before we, we reach uh, production. So it was really, um, it was really a great experience for us so far. Yeah, that's awesome. And before we continue with the rest of the question, I know as an end user community uh, company, uh, sharing stories about how you use these technologies, not just hearing from the vendors, it's very crucial for the community because people want to learn from uh, the lessons and the mistakes that, that, that others have made. Did you, at, did you get to attend uh, KubeCon, the last KubeCon that happened in any or the EU one? So unfortunately we, we did not, we did not get the chance to attend. We are hoping to attend the next one in, uh, in May, I think in Spain, right? Yeah. Um, right, so we are hoping. Did you get the chance? Yeah, probably you didn't get the chance to uh, to submit CFP. Yeah, we did. We actually we submitted. The oh, CFP nice. And we're, yeah, uh, so we're hoping even to to come uh, to attend the speakers as well. So, nice, nice. Uh, I'll definitely be looking towards uh, some of the lessons you learned. I took my CKS uh, recently. I passed. <laughs> Thank God. So it's always interesting <laughs> to learn how others are exploring things around the cloud native ecosystem and also especially when it comes to security because with all the supply chain issues and everything happening we definitely need to know more about how uh, we will all secure our things so now on the topic of security um what are the trends you are observing in the cloud native industry that you think should be taken seriously when it comes to security well, I think um, uh, I think aside from service mesh alone, which is also gaining a lot of popularity, um, so the concept of I think chaos engineering is is most um, is most interesting to us. The ability to kind of fail uh, services and infrastructure on purpose and do it so easily, you know, kind of like a built-in way of configuring uh, things to fail is is great for us. We've heard Litmus chaos was a re uh, recently introduced uh, as, as an incubate incubate and um, so that uh, I think uh, traffic splits also and uh, open telemetry is something we're very excited about uh, kind of a unified way of, of dealing with all kinds of uh, uh, of tools that can gather metrics um, I think maybe something else we can think so of. um yeah thanks um, so we are we are taking a look at the uh, at the OPA as well, um, along with some new feature of, of uh, Linkerd that was uh, introduced recently regarding uh, policies between uh, workloads in the cluster. Um, so as, as, as we grow our cluster and, and have more workloads, um, we would have to, to make it uh, organized in a way that, um, well, they call, they call Kubernetes today is the OS of the cloud, right? So, so when you run when you run so many so many stuff so many workloads uh, on Kubernetes, sometimes it tends to be uh, quite um, quite a mess to manage. So we are taking a look into this in the security aspect, especially to make sure that only the workloads who need to actually be able to speak to each other um, can do so. Um, in addition to storm tools, uh, well, all, all of us uh, still have a little back hurt from the from the recent log for j problems right um yeah <clears throat> i know ellie had, <laughs> ellie had many uh, many long nights uh, and so we have we now have we 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 implemented a very very cool way of of being uh, ahead of this so next time the log for j the next log for j is, is published um we will probably know it before others will know it. Uh, we have a very, very intense system that scans our containers before they ever leave our our dev uh, machines. 
and we are using some some open source utilities along with uh, with some vendors to help us do so. Um, so tools like Gripe and Snick, for example, um, and other tools from Anchor that we are evaluating as well, uh, which is super important. There, there are two there are two main uh, vectors here. In addition to not be able to push an infected image. Sometimes, like we saw with Log4j, the image was already there, deployed on the production of, of probably everyone. Um, and then the, the, the zero day or the vulnerability was, was found when the image was already there. So, so it's, it's a very important thing to note that sometimes you will not introduce the vulnerability when you add something new, but, but many times you will find a vulnerability in something you already have deployed onto your customer's production environments. It's very important to be able to monitor this. Yeah, also, also. Log4j spoiled lots of uh, holiday plans. So <laughs> no one wanted to repeat itself again. Sorry, Eli. Yeah, I, also, I thought also uh, Gal had to, uh, wanted to mention. Yeah, um, not only like, uh... As, a, as our scale grows, so we are looking for the most um, efficient ways to manage our clusters and secure as well. So we are getting into the GitOps um, topologies. We are implementing GitOps for us to securely manage and have the least privileges uh, way of managing our remote clusters. So that's something we're also starting implementing. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I think for my next question, you've already addressed most of it when uh, Omri mentioned uh, Log4j. And also for the sake of the listeners who might not be aware, Omri mentioned OPA, it means Open Policy Agents, right? That's what you were referring to, Omri. Yeah, so awesome. Yeah, uh, my next question, I think you've covered most of it already. 2020 was a huge challenge for everyone in the industry. You already mentioned Log4j, there was solar winds, there was quite a lot of supply chain security issues and other things that were happening. As a company, Salt Lake, it, probably not for your client, what other uh, challenges was thrown? Did 2021 or 2020 throw at you that really shook the company, but you were able to scale through it? Um, so I think, you know, being a, a security company puts us a little bit, uh, you know, on, on, a, on a very high high bar. Um, really can't allow uh, any any you know pitfalls there. Uh, but aside from security, I think our biggest challenge uh, today is around scale. So being able to to kind of um, scale fast um, and doing that in, with with a minimal team. So you know, uh, Gal Gal has a fairly small team which does pretty much everything. Uh, we're looking at adding other SREs. Um, we're really looking at observability and reliability as, as the kind of big, two big things that are, are uh, ahead of us. Um, so being able to, to leverage uh, kind of te technologies that would allow us to, first of all, sleep better, you know, uh, be able to kind of be on top of those things, um, uh, you know, before they happen. Uh, these are kind of the things that are, you know, we're looking into. But also when we're deploying things, uh, we'd like to be able to kind of test those things out before they reach production. Uh, so canary deployments is really the, the, the next big thing for us in terms of, of deployment, uh, integrating that into our GitOps and CI CD environment and you know, kind of pushing a new version of some kind of deployment and um, splitting the traffic, you know, uh, trying it a little bit, seeing if it works, then rolling back automatically would really uh, do a lot for us. Um, I think those are kind of the big topics that are at. Yeah, awesome. Definitely getting better sleep is a mo major motivation for almost all of us, especially when the industry always keeps throwing new things. Once, when you think you are done with one, another one comes up. And you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think the, my next question goes to Ralph. Um, you already mentioned that you do multi-cloud. Uh, do you also do multi-tenants? Uh, how do you distribute the workloads between your clusters uh, since you have multi-cloud already? And what challenges does this, just using multi-cloud bring to you? 
and multi-tenant if you do multi-tenant? We don't do multi-tenant at the moment. Uh, that's most centrally something we are uh, heading towards. Uh, I think the most challenging thing about running like a multi-cloud is managing it, not only in terms of like deployments, but you know, having the right scale, having the right resources. Your monitoring is now needs to support like multiple clusters. So uh, instead of like a single child, you now have like a bunch of childs you need to take care of. Uh, but with tools of observability like Datadog, we use Jaeger as well. Uh, we find ourselves managing it the right way instead of like running after each cluster, making sure uh, you know it has the right resources, it operates normally. We usually set our monitoring to notify us when something goes bad and learn from like a, uh, from past incidents. So we'll be more reactive than running after managing each cloud provider. And I think another challenge is cloud provider issues. I mean, it's not that rare, but cloud providers does have issues. And so that can also affect your operations, but you need to be prepared to like um, shift users from one, one cloud to another and have all of these automations that allows you to stay highly available and route traffic between clouds to support the, the load or any chances of incidents at the cloud provider level. Yeah, definitely. I want yeah. to add to this. Okay, uh, sure. Tommy, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so like, like as, a, as, as a message to the community, um, everyone have, uh, or, or at least most people should have uh, redundancies, right? Like, um, if we are mostly deployed in our example in AWS, and then we have uh, we have another cloud provider as, as the um, as the resiliency um, provider in case something goes wrong, test it. Okay, it's not enough to have it ready for the day, right? We need to test it because if you don't test it on the day you need it, like it might not work. So um, this this uh, resembles with what with what Ellie said before. We are going to to introduce in uh, 2022 uh, of chaos engineering. This this can be um, one one of the one of the kind of things we will want to test as fast as possible um, automatically. Not only having a way to do it manually, but automatically. Um, it happens a lot. Services uh, go down. Uh, it's normal. This is the, the way the cloud acts, right? When when things get super complicated, they tend to break sometimes. Uh, so yeah, so test test your emergency protocols. Life sometimes can be chaos engineering, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think even if we don't learn anything from uh, the pandemic that has happened, one thing we should learn is things can go wrong and they can really go wrong really bad. <laughs> so I, I, uh, based on what Omri said, everything needs to be tested to make sure that we are ready. Things can go wrong at any time. And Guy was mentioning about uh, using multi-cloud and making sure, sure there's redundancy. I think some of the provider issues we've seen with the service provider that yeah, this data center bumps down to another one that kept having downtime almost regularly. You know, no matter how big the service provider is, things can go wrong. So, and you being able to prepare is a very crucial thing that as a company, one definitely needs to make sure that in case things go wrong, there's always something that to keep the service running because nobody wants to lose money when things go wrong. <laughs> yeah. If I can add, Sometimes not being hosted on a certain cloud provider doesn't necessarily mean one of your services uh, is not rely, does not rely on that cloud provider. For example, we've seen in the AWS incident that Quay Docker repository did had some issues. So not yeah. Only, yeah, so be prepared for that as well. If you're having a service, keep in mind, you'll always have to have a backup plan for that service as well. So because, which, which means your provider's provider can go wrong if, if something is wrong with your provider. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Awesome, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, my next question I think is still for Gal. Uh, 
I know definitely you will have a lot of automations and other things happening. How do you manage cluster automations, things around upgrades, versioning, testing, rollouts, rolling out new features, etc.? Um, it's mostly, I think, a cooperation between the DevOps and the uh, developers. I mean, we need to have the right pipelines and have the right capabilities to allow developers to add these tests before they reach um, before they reach production. I think um, it's not only in the phase of the it's not only in the phase of um, the testing, but also once deployed to production. I think there is a challenge to monitor it properly. Once the feature is released monitoring or having the right visibility of, on the feature will allow you to better understand how it behaves throughout time. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that the moment you release a feature, it's, it will work properly for good. Uh, you need to have proper visibility and monitoring throughout time to detect like future fixes, issues. Uh, so it's mostly a cooperation between the developers and and DevOps to, to make this platform. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but in all of this that we've been talking about, what do you think is next in terms of cloud native at uh, salt security? Um, well, I think well, so far the, the tools that we've we've uh, we've learned uh, that are available are you know are really there's a there's a lot of, there's a lot of abundance of, of uh, utilities and products. Uh, uh, every day we look, you know, we go on, uh, we go on CNCF. You know, we see the, the kind of landscape. We see new and new tools. We have a backlog of things that we wanna we wanna go through. Um, so you know, the, the, so far I think it's very it, it's something that we can't cover. Like so many projects, uh, you know, we have uh, we have a lot of plans and and. Not a lot of not enough time to to kind of try things out. Uh, I think the, the tools that are available today are kind of uh, filling up our, our backlog, and we have uh, things to look at. Um, I think mostly around uh, around Kubernetes, um, you know, things that are kind of supplements to Kubernetes uh, and monitoring are, are those. Um, I can't think of specific projects that we we haven't listed, we haven't uh, spoken about that you know that we're looking into, but all those are you know our plans forward. And I think those are kind of the things that we're looking into. Um, so yeah. Yeah, awesome, sorry. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong thing on my system. Yeah, awesome. And I think, yeah, I think you and Omri uh, work on the platform, right? So I think uh, you'll be able to talk more about uh, developer experience, you know, with introducing all these new uh, technologies and bringing in all these uh, upgrades and new improvements to your cluster, your developers need to use it. How do they interact with your clusters and how do you manage the development life cycle and maintenance and troubleshooting with them? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, really big um, thing where we are um, trying our best to allow our developers to not only be able to use this stuff, but also to understand this stuff. Because when something breaks, um, in a company like Salt, uh, we are recruiting all the time. And we are, we are scaling not only in our workloads, but, but also in our, in our human resources. Um, so you you would you would want to be able to um, to um, introduce new developers uh, to the system, uh, and also when you introduce a new technology, you would want your existing developers to be able to to use it properly. Uh, but not less important, like I said, to understand it because if they don't understand it, then then we will we will be the bottleneck, right, in in solving everything because um, everyone will come to us. Um, so our our development environment, since they are, um, it became uh, quite a challenge to to run it on a local dev computer. Uh, we are using uh, we are using Kubernetes to test our our stuff. Um, 
also uh, if if you remember one of the one of the 12 factor app recommendations or or standards is to to make the developer work on a, on an environment that is as close as possible to production right uh, so this is this is how we do it um, this uh, cluster or clusters uh, we we use telepresence to connect to them uh so telepresence is a is a really cool project and and their latest version is is very nice we are using it extensively uh, and this way when when a developer um is working on on one of our many services he can uh, he can instrument only this service on his local machine and have this service talk to the rest of the of the cluster as if he was sitting inside the cluster. So um, th this is a project we've graduated uh, a while ago. People are using it, they are loving it. Um, and it also helps us to save on some costs uh, because rather than having uh, one giant cluster that, that developers are, are fighting over, right? Uh, we, have, we have many small namespaces um, for which we, we pay less and the developers are not um, waiting in line to test their stuff on the cluster. Right. So, like when you when a developer wants to test something, he can, you know, he can spin up a whole Kubernetes cluster um, just for himself, and and you know a, a whole environment will, will be spun up, and then that developer can can test um, can test his work on that cluster, and also even debug one of those services on his local machine by routing the traffic into his uh, laptop and also resolving DNS, uh, you know, DNS request uh, as if, you know, like we said, as if he was in the cluster. So one of the services can talk directly to the pods in, the, in Kubernetes, which gives you like a feeling that you're, you're inside a cluster, you can actually develop it inside it, um, which really solves a lot of problems we had before. You know. Yeah, that's really awesome. And yeah, it's been interesting, uh, some of your experiences and the uh, some of the insights you've been sharing. I know definitely our community will uh, appreciate this kind of content. But as an end user community, you know, the CNCF landscape is like this landmine of new things always coming up and new technology. Sometimes if you go there today and tomorrow you go back, you're like, oh, this thing has expanded. There are new things here. So what's your experience like as an end user company uh, uh, in the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, can you share more about your experience as probably individuals, practitioners within the ecosystem and as your company? Yeah, so um, so as you said, the, the CNCF landscape is, a, is an awesome, awesome website. Um, we learn a lot by, by, um, by polling it like every few days. Um, and and so far the community was amazing. Uh, we didn't have any pro any project that we we needed some community involvement and and we didn't find the people or or the people were not uh, responsive. Um, so we really think that CNCF uh, made made a great community um, which is supportive and and very fun to be involved in. Um, so on our on our experience, like for example, the process we've had with uh, with the Linkerd community, which was was very fun. Um, we had some questions. We approached them in in their Slack, uh, and we developed uh, some kind of a, of a really warm and nice relationship in which we uh, we are hosted in their in their um, community calls and talking about the features we use and, and, and educating other people of the, of the community. So, um, yeah, this was our, our experience. It was, it was very nice. Yeah, that's really awesome. You know, one of the great things about the community community is you are always welcome and you, you get that welcome feeling where you come even as someone that's completely new to the ecosystem. It's easy for you to learn new things and also learn from the experiences of others. Yeah, and I also noticed something in your background, Omri. Uh, are you a Star Wars fan? And probably a good developer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I was. I was exposed. Yeah, my. Um, 
one of them is actually my my girlfriend she did it uh <laughs> nice. small one yeah um, and then this gopher is from uh from gopher con tel aviv right before covid hit uh it was oh, okay. last last moment so yeah i love golang <laughs> awesome <laughs> ellie you wanted to say something <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying go go first. You know, we yeah, we love go. Uh, I love I love that doll specifically. I think it's uh, it's awesome. And, yeah, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, so I think I've exhausted most of the questions that I uh, I have. Is there anything else you want to shed more light on or uh, share with the community? Uh, I think we mentioned it, but I think a service mesh interface is something that we really, really want to see evolve uh, in, in, the, in the coming months. Um, we really hope, you know, these, these are kind of pushed forward, you know, with Istio and, and uh, Linkerd and all, you know, dashboards like Kiali. So that's something we really would like to uh, contribute and, and see how it evolves. That's kind of the big thing that we're hoping to see. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you for most of it. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much, Ellie and uh, Omri uh, and Gal also. Thank you very much for joining us today. And it's really been an enlightening session. Uh, I personally like a lot. I've been delving more into Kubernetes uh, security lately and hearing some of the challenges and lessons you've learned, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of resonates with a lot of things I've been delving into. And it's awesome to see people doing most of it in the in real life now. Thank you very much everyone for joining the latest episode of the Cloud Native End User Lounge. It was great to have the team from Salt Security talking to us about their usage of Cloud Native ecosystem and the security landscape of Cloud Native as a whole. We also really loved the, uh, the flow in which the questions and some of the awesome new information that they've shared with us. We bring you the latest cloud native end user stories on the fourth Thursday of the month at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Don't forget to also join us uh, for KubeCon Cloud Native Con EU in May. Hopefully you will you probably hear the team from uh, uh, Salt Security sharing more about their experiences at the conference. Hopefully we are able to meet in Spain. Definitely I'll be going to Spain. Maybe at least I get to travel. <laughs> to a conference oh. in real life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Everyone and you also, yeah. yeah, exactly. And you also hear uh, a lot of latest things from the cloud native community. And if you also like to showcase your usage of the cloud native tools as an end user, join the end user community with more details on cncf.io slash end user. Thank you very much for joining us today and see you next time. Thanks for having, Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. It was great.